As participants log on to the webinar, I'd like to welcome everyone. My name is Judith Abitan. I'm the Executive Director of the Raoul Wallenberg Center for Human Rights. And I'm speaking to you today from Montreal. The Montreal Institute for Genocide and Human Rights Studies and the Raoul Wallenberg Center for Human Rights, in collaboration with our partners, Freedom House, the National Endowment for Democracy, China Digital Times, the Geneva Summit for Human Rights and Democracy, the Uyghur Rights Advocacy Project, the Canada-Tibet Committee, the International Coalition to End Transplant Abuse in China, the Federation for a Democratic China, Hong Kong Watch, the McDonald Laurier Institute, and Initiatives for China and the Nobel Women's Initiative present to you today a conference on a China at a Crossroads, Standing Up for Human Rights During the Pandemic. This conference brings together leading voices to discuss the human rights situation in China during the coronavirus pandemic, and we'll discuss three main themes. China's attempt to quarantine the truth and increasing threats against the media and journalists, China's political prisoners and mistreatment of minorities, identifying ways to hold the Chinese government accountable for the pandemic and human rights abuses. I will be moderating the first panel, and I'm delighted to have with us today a distinguished group of panelists. Xiao Zhang is a director and research scientist at Counter Lab at the University of Berkeley, California, and founder and editor of, Digital, of China Digital Times. Sarah Cook is the senior research analyst for China at Freedom House and director of the China Media Bulletin. And Christopher Walker is the vice president of studies and analysis at the National Endowment for Democracy. The CCP led a disinformation campaign about the rampant spread of COVID-19 through its massive state sanctioned surveillance and suppression of data, misrepresentation of information, silencing and criminalizing of dissent, and the disappearance of whistleblowers, all of which reflect the breadth of criminality and corruption in the party. The first question is for Xiao. Xiao, to what extent can the CCP be held accountable for the initial cover-up of the COVID-19 outbreak in Wuhan, the arrests and disappearances of doctors and dissidents, the extensive related censorship, disinformation campaign, and the use of surveillance technology? Well, thank you, Judith, for the important uh, event. And thank you for posing that important question. When uh, this pandemic, even in the earliest stage, uh, in early January, late January, uh, we have already followed the Chinese social media closely. And at a time, there was the beginning of anxiety, of the uh, of fear, but also uh, seeking for help and for lack of government information and also the strong repression of online and, and, and media. Um, the Chinese people at a time clearly knew that that was the fundamental factor that caused this epidemic when so large. So accountability, yes, but that voice is firstly heard from the Chinese people themselves. And let me give you some examples. But before I even go to that, let me start from two days ago. The Chinese uh, National the State uh, Council of Information Office issued a white paper listed the government narrative and their version of facts of what in China happened from the beginning until now about the pandemic. And here's something really interesting on um, the Chinese official media that uh, um, they on Weibo, the foreign minister person, uh, spokesperson Hua Chunying, posted the following message about the white paper. It said, she said that the history of to combat against pandemic, it should leave a correct collective memory for all mankind. This is the Gen Chinese government spokesperson said, the white paper of the government is leave a correct collective memory. 
And that comment on Chinese social media Weibo was immediately backfired by hundreds of posts, the comments you can see it right now, that netizens are posting saying, who's correct collective memory? Who define correct? Can my memory be myself? What about Dr. Li Wenliang? Does he count it as an incorrect memory? Who is responsible to in charge of our memories? Now, let's go back to the beginning of the pandemic. Let's talk about the punishment of medical workers, including Dr. Li Wenliang, who are whistleblowers. Let's talk about how Chinese government muzzled citizen journalists like Chen Qiushi, Fang Bin, Li Zehua, to name a few. Let's talk about Chinese government arrested dissidents, quite suppressed political critiques. Let's name Xu Zhiyong and Ren Zhiqiang. And finally, Chinese government also censored public health information online because Xi Jinping is such a one-man rule and China become far more authoritarian over the years. So the public space has been shrunk. Therefore, the local authority actually delayed and concealed information from the public. Uh, even despite the early evidence of human-to-human -human transmission, when the medical staff became infected, this information did not get to the public for weeks. And that would not happen in a democratic country, which there's an open political system and will identify the outbreak earlier and also will share, inform its own public and the global community in a much more timely fashion. But that unfortunately did not happen in China. This delay to inform also including the international organization like WHO. Well, I also want to say WHO failed its own responsibility to vet the information from the Chinese authority, right? On the January 14th, the WHO had a tweet said, preliminary investigations conducted by Chinese authorities has found no clear evidence of human to human transmission of the novel coronavirus identified in Wuhan, China. But that was simply just compound on the Chinese government official information and a narrative. And this misinformation allowing this lethal outbreak to sweep across the globe. Now, let's go to talk about what happened in China since January and February. The continued suppression of any kind of speaking out and information about a pandemic. The Wuhan author Fang Fang, who has been writing her Wuhan diary, that since she was locked down at home with the 11 million Wuhan people, she became the target of the state. And any information about government credibility, about their false number, Wuhan's real death toll, any information about origin of the virus, any information about something different from the Chinese government official narratives, uh, again, 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 being suppressed and people who are speaking out are being arrested or silenced. And I'll give you one more example for ordinary Wuhan mother, Yang Min, who lost her 24 years old daughter. And she herself is a survivor of the coronavirus. On May 11th, she hold a sign, read that the government concealed the truth of the epidemic, giving me back my daughter. And on the other side of the sign, it says injustice. She was violently being driven away by the police. And we haven't seen her ever since. I will simply stop here to take more questions before uh, you know, there's many other issues we can address about truth, pandemic, and the behavior of Chinese government. Thank you very much, Xiao, for these very important remarks. Um, I'm going to move. Uh, we'll come back to you in a few minutes after we hear from Sarah and Chris. Um, I'm going to move to Sarah now with the second question. Um, Sarah, what are some of the key trends observed during the past few years regarding censorship of the media 
journalism, and the internet in China. How has the pandemic compounded this censorship? And how has China emerged as the, as the world's leading jailer of journalists? Sarah. Thank you, Judith. So um, I'm going to take a step back to answer Judith's question and then from what Xiao said and then come back to the pandemic. And so I think what we see is that, you know, as many of you know, China has long been home to one of the world's most restrictive media internet landscapes. And in fact, it is home to the most sophisticated and multi-layered apparatus of censorship um, and surveillance in the world. Um, but as Xiao was saying, over the past five to 10 years, particularly under Xi Jinping's leadership, it's become even more restrictive. And so I think there's three trends that we've seen um, that are relevant and really tie into the conversation about the pandemic. Uh, the first is we've seen tightened, expanded, and more automated internet censorship in China. So um, Freedom House, every year we do an annual assessment of internet freedom in 65 countries around the world it's called Freedom on the Net. Um, and last year, uh, China emerged as the worst abuser of internet freedom for the fourth year in a row. But perhaps even more interesting is China's score today relative to when we started the project 10 years ago. And there's been a notable decline. So it's not just that China is one of the most restrictive places for the internet anywhere in the world, where people actually have access, say not North Korea, but even relative to the amount of freedom and communication and anonymity um, that Chinese people were able to have 10 years ago, the space has shrunk considerably um, over, the last, um, over the last decade. Um, and one of the thing, the ways that's manifested and had already begun in 2018 and 2019 um, is that the scale of content removals and website closures and social media account deletions um, was expanding. And so what used to be that if you wrote something that the, the, the Chinese government didn't like or the social media company was afraid would get them in trouble, the comment would be deleted. And that still happens en masse. But increasingly, we're seeing that people's actual full accounts are being deleted. And particularly on WeChat, which is this uh, social media platform that kind of combines Facebook and ePay um, and all kinds of different functions and is really essential to people's day-to-day -day life in China today, we're seeing more and more people having their whole account be shut down. Um, we're also seeing more um, deletion and, and restrictions on apolitical topics and platforms, entertainment, dating, celebrity gossip. And increasingly, the Chinese applications are able to um, automate censorship more and expand and the, the sophistication and, and breadth of the censorship um, by using artificial intelligence. So I think that's one of the things um, that we were seeing before the pandemic. One of the other things is that the topics of censorship and what is considered sensitive information has also expanded. Um, so I think a lot of people will think of, you know, Tiananmen Square, Tibet, Falun Gong, Uyghurs, any kind of democracy movement, uh, exposure of human rights abuses. But when we look at, and Freedom House has analyzed a lot of the censorship directives that actually Xiao's uh, team at China Digital Times obtains and publishes and translates, um, we've done content analysis. And one of the top topics of breaking news that is regularly censored is information about public health and safety. So I think that's where you see what happened with regards to the pandemic has not been an anomaly. It was something that was perhaps um, going to happen at one point or another, simply because of the systematic censorship um, and restrictions that surround even topics of, of, of public health and safety in China. I think the other thing, um, the second trend I would say, um, is, is that the authorities are increasingly resorting to legal reprisals. So again, it's not just that your comment will be censored, um, but people are, are basically being detained and, and, and jailed. And Judith mentioned that China is the, the world's largest um, leading jailer of journalists. And we do see um, cases, even fairly recently, there was a professional journalist who was sentenced to 15 years in prison um, for exposing corruption. But actually, when you look at it, professional journalists still comprise a fairly small proportion of Chinese citizens who are detained or imprisoned for sharing information what's happening in the country. And it's largely because of the, the institutionalized censorship of the media that doesn't actually usually allow their reports to even make it to print. And so when you look at lists of jail journalists, you see a lot of citizen journalists, a lot of bloggers, a lot of activists, a lot of members of ethnic minorities like Uyghurs and Tibetans. But even those lists um, are still a drop in the bucket in terms of the number of ordinary Chinese citizens um, that uh, get detained for online offenses. And you see that in reports from grassroots um, websites and human rights groups from court verdicts that we've looked at. And so one of the things that we've seen is that in this space too, um, 
the various categories of Chinese citizens that risk being detained or obtaining legal reprisals for accessing or sharing information online has also expanded in recent years. And so we've seen more people who use Twitter being um, uh, called in by police. We've seen people who um, get detained and even sentenced to prison either for using or often for sharing various tools that allow people to jump the great firewall, uh, various activists who operate civil society or human rights related websites being sentenced to very long prison terms. And all of these activities just a few years ago were really considered to be on the safe side of the red lines. And so that's, again, one of the reasons why you see somebody like Li Wenliang and some of the doctors in Wuhan basically thinking that, you know, there's this vibes and I'm going to share something on a relatively private chat group with my colleagues um, saying that we have this uh, uh, emerging SARS-like virus in our city and you want to take precautions. And so they don't even expect that they're going to face some kind of legal reprisal, uh, but then they do. And in his case, it was a reprimand and he was forced to uh, retract uh, and sign this kind of very communist, I would say, you know, kind of confession. Um, but we see a lot of cases of, of ordinary WeChat users being sentenced to prison and um, and facing prosecution. And I'll, I'll give you a few examples from 2019. I think it gives a good sense for uh, the scope and, and of how common actually uh, this is becoming uh, in China for people whose names we might not see, you know, headlines say in, in, in a New York Times article or that many of us might not have heard of. So we saw, for example, a fellow who wasn't even just writing on WeChat, but was just moderating a popular WeChat account that shared news from outside China for people inside the firewall. Um, and he was sentenced to two years in prison. A professor from Guangdong province was jailed for three and a half years for posting images related to the to, to people who practice Falun Gong, the persecution they face in China. A 22 year old Tibetan monk was arrested for expressing uh, concerns about Beijing's policies related to Tibetan language. Um, and, and for Uyghurs in, in Xinjiang, we don't even know accurate numbers for how many people have been detained and sentenced for uh, simply for using social media. But one case that we do know about was a 24-year-old soccer player um, who was sent to a re-education camp because he'd used WeChat to contact family members who had fled the country. So I think that just gives a little bit of context, context again, to how often it actually happens in China uh, that ordinary users, um, uh, especially of WeChat, uh, face uh, legal repercussions repercussions. And then the third trend I want to talk about, which kind of brings us back to more of the, the professional, of the profession of journalism, uh, is the decline in investigative journalism. And so you see a situation where Chinese journalists have long operated in an extremely restrictive media environment. Um, but even in that, and often reported very courageously about all kinds of scandals, tainted vaccines, tainted milk, um, all kinds of uh, incidents, bullet train crashes, um, uh, but we have seen that the space and the conditions for investigative journalism uh, have shrunk since 2013. Um, and in fact, that the actual number of investigative journalists has declined. So there was one um, study by some Chinese academics that found that between 2011 and 2017, uh, the number of investigative journalists in China uh, decreased by almost by half. Um, and even since then, we've seen some of the real leading investigative journalists in China whole teams that have just been, that were just disbanded. And a lot of those teams were at these um, uh, commercially oriented news outlets. So not the main uh, state run media that we often think of, the People's Daily or, or China Central Television, but uh, smaller uh, commercially oriented outlets um, uh, that are still partially state owned, uh, but are able, uh, are a bit more autonomous. Um, um, but they've also, a lot, number of them have been shut down. Their investigative journalism teams have been gutted. Um, and even the ones that, when they do get an article out, there are all kinds of new controls that are in place to say stop um, internet portals from reposting them. Um, and that was one kind of a ban that happened, for example, to Caixin. And so those are three of the trends that we've seen, I would say, emerging and evolving over the last few years, particularly in 2019. When we look at what happened during the pandemic and kind of bringing it back to the present, uh, there are three points that I would, I would raise. Uh, one, as Xiao was mentioning, we saw a lot of examples of Chinese police working very hard to muzzle independent source of information, uh, particularly at the height of, of the outbreak in Wuhan. And, and Xiao mentioned three of the, the very courageous citizen journalists who had been able to film from within the city who were detained. And as far as we know, one uh, has, has gone home, but two, I think, are, are still, we haven't heard from them. Um, but those are actually just the tip of the iceberg. Um, one NGO, uh, Chinese Human Rights Defenders has documented almost 900 cases, cases um, of Chinese internet users who were detained uh, through, I think it was till early April, uh, for quote, spreading rumors. 
But from the cases um, whose details we know and we've looked at, it's very clear that many of them were actually reporting firsthand observations of what was happening in their lives or in their community, especially in Wuhan, or criticizing the Chinese government's response, rather than, say, maliciously spreading some kind of disinformation regarding the pandemic. Um, and similarly, the, the Falun Dafa Information Center is also reporting an uptick of arrests of Falun Gong practitioners throughout China, also numbering in the hundreds, including many who were trying to share uncensored news about the pandemic or tools for how to jump the firewall. I think the second thing we've seen is that um, social media platforms like WeChat have cracked down a large number of personal accounts of people who were sharing even innocuous or factual, in some cases like state approved content, and people had their accounts shut down in the middle of a pandemic. People are in lockdown, they can't reach their families, uh, they're having to order all of their food online and take out and things like that, and their link to the outside world is just shut down just like that. And there's really like no appeals process, it just happens all of a sudden and that's it. Um, and that we saw, saw lots of reports of reports of that happening. And the third thing, which I, I kind of always like to try to end on an optimistic note, <laughs> um, actually relates to the commercial media and investigative journalists. And it's, it was really inspiring to see uh, how many risks they were willing to take uh, to cover what was happening in Wuhan. We used to see these outbursts happen more often. They bec become rarer, and so it really stood out. But several commercialized and financial news outlets in China um, really tried to outpace censors or even directly defy them. And in fact, a lot of what we know about the early cover-up it's thanks to reporting by journalists inside China. A lot of those articles were then, of course, censored inside China. Uh, but then that's when you kind of see this a broader array of ways in which information circulates despite the censors. Um, archives outside the Great Firewall, all kinds of creative ways, uh, coding, emojis, Korean, Google Translate, all, all kinds of ways in which these articles were shared within the firewall. And then a whole array of outlets, uh, Chinese language outlets, um, outside of China, in Hong Kong, and Taiwan, the diaspora, Radio Free Asia, even say the New York Times Chinese language website, picking up on these stories and information. Um, and all of that actually reaching back in various ways to people inside China. So I, I think I would just end on that, that one of the things that we see is that um, censorship and controls over the media have tightened under Xi Jinping in ways that would have previously maybe been unimaginable to a lot of us who were following, uh, who have been following China for some time. And, um, but but um, but important information does still break through. Thank you very much for these extremely insightful uh, remarks, Sarah. And we'll come back to you in a few minutes as well. I'm going to move to the third question, um, which is for Chris Walker. So, Chris, um, can you speak about the CCP's international censorship ambitions and how it seeks to defend and also advance its position by suppressing voices beyond China's borders? as well as the implications of the censorship for democratic systems and the democratic idea. Chris. So thank you so much for the question, Judith. I'd first like to just take this chance, uh, since they're here with me, to recognize my co-panelists, uh, Xiao Chang and Sarah Cook, who I respect so much and who've done such critically important work over the years to help audiences understand China and the way uh, that country's authorities uh, tries to impact uh, democracy around the world. They're really among the foremost minds on these issues, and it's a privilege for me to be on this panel with them today. And so I'm going to touch uh, briefly on three points, uh, which will actually build upon much of what Sarah and Xiao have alluded to. And I'd, I'd start with the first point, which is that the authorities in, in China, as we've heard, make a priority of controlling information and ensuring alternative points of view are sidelined within China. And the crackdown to this end has intensified over the last years. Uh, this is, I would note, part of a broader pattern that's visible in many parts of the world, and especially so in other repressive settings, including in places like uh, Russia and Iran. But I think what's important to recognize is that um, as regimes like the one in China has become more active internationally, it's actually had an impact on the integrity of information systems and freedom of the media internationally, including within democratic societies. And I think one of the questions we need to ask ourselves is, why would a regime that works with such purpose at home to manage and suppress free expression do otherwise beyond its borders? 
And I think what we're seeing is that um, to the extent circumstances permit, the Chinese authorities and those working with them try to uh, put off limits, issues that they themselves feel are out of bounds, uh, even within democratic societies. And I'd note it was um, four years ago this month that um, this sort of issue was brought into focus when um, it was a visit, I believe, to Ottawa by China's foreign minister and a Canadian reporter sought to ask a question and was scolded by the um, Chinese foreign minister at the time. And I think it brought into relief the, the mindset that uh, the Chinese authorities bring to these sorts of issues. And if anything, since that time, we've seen even more um, of this sort of effort to curb speech beyond China's borders on issues that uh, the Chinese authorities feel are out of bounds. And so within Canada, to use this example, uh, there have been concerns raised about the Chinese government's impact on the expression of uh, Chinese Canadians. And this, I think, is part of a pattern we've seen in any number of countries, one that's uh, quite disturbing. I think as we think about how to um, address these issues, uh, my colleagues and I at the International Forum for, for Democratic Studies have been uh, working on a series of papers looking at different aspects of the challenge that's emerged to free speech, both in the university setting, in the media setting, and elsewhere. And we've had some really terrific analysts take a close look at this, including uh, Edward Lucas, who's looked at the issue in the context of uh, the journalistic and media, media realm. Uh, Martin Halla has looked at the ways in which investment from China has non-economic costs and can repurpose democratic institutions for uh, non-democratic ends. And the most recent paper we've released is authored by Glenn Tifford of the Hoover Institution, who looked at um, how intellectual inquiry is being uh, curbed by the CCP in a whole host of settings, many of which are in uh, open societies. And I think if anything, the pandemic is going to deepen the vulnerabilities that these institutions face either because it'll be uh, more difficult to raise money philanthropically in the university context, or the economic situation will become more uh, fraught for independent news media, which has been the case for years and years around the world in so many settings. And it's worth noting that as independent media has been stretched around the world, um, Chinese investments, Chinese state investments in media both through the outlets that Sarah alluded to, uh, such as Xinhua and CGTN, but through a range of other um, media outlets and, and instruments has uh, grown considerably. And in so many settings now, there is a far more significant presence of Chinese state or Chinese state aligned media than there was certainly a decade ago. And this is happening concurrently with the uh, stress that's being placed on independent media, including in fragile democracies. And one of the things that uh, the reports we've released earlier this year has found is that we really need to think hard about how to uh, strengthen the resilience of independent media generally, but also in the context of settings where uh, Chinese state media is making inroads as a way to both um, shape public discussion in these settings, but also to exclude from the discussion issues that the Chinese authorities uh, deem to be off limits. And finally, let me just say a word about uh, the issue of technology. It's really not possible to discuss the challenge we face in the globalization era and in the era of the globalization of censorship without taking into account the increasing importance of technology and how uh, people understand the world around them, uh, how opinions are formed, and how we communicate with each other. I think um, as we uh, proceed through the pandemic, we're seeing uh, we're really being stretched. On the one hand, we're relying on technology more than ever. At the same time, we haven't really built the norms around the technology that can ensure we can stimulate a race to the top when it comes to free expression, the transparency of information, and the integrity of it, rather than a race to the bottom which will privilege the manipulation of information, uh, opacity, and censorship and surveillance. 
And I think this is something that really needs to be prioritized. On this count, I'd commend our audience to really a first-rate article that Xiao Chang wrote in the January 20, um, 2019 issue of the Journal of Democracy, looking at these issues. I think just coming back to conclude to a point that Sarah made with respect to the rapid advances that China has made in the use of technology uh, for domestic purposes. And I'd really stress the point that um, the innovations that are being incubated at the domestic level in China in an era of globalization are now being migrated beyond China's borders such that the platforms, the tools, the systems uh, that many countries are adopting in a wide variety of settings, ranging from authoritarian countries around the world, but also to democracies um, as far, far afield as Latin America to Sub-Saharan Africa to Southeastern Europe uh, and elsewhere uh, are now starting to adopt uh, technologies that uh, may not have the sort of standards and norms wrapped around them that are likely to enrich and enhance democratic accountability on the contrary. And I think to the extent that uh, China's authorities have gained a running start in part because of some assumptions that we all had about the extent of um, the benefits of integration and um, or the mutual benefits of integration have to be rethought so that this is not simply um, unconditional engagement in these spheres where human rights and democratic account accountability are central, but instead that we have principled engagement on these counts that ensure uh, democratic and human rights values are put front and center. And I just conclude by saying that given the stakes involved for all of us, it's really imperative that we strengthen our resilience in the face of an advance, advancing authoritarian tide that's led by China uh, and the censorship and control that comes along with it. And with that, I'm happy to turn to uh, questions. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Chris. Um, what I'm going to do quickly is I'm going to revert back to Xiao with one quick question and then back to you and Sarah with our final question. And then we're going to take some questions from the actual from the audience. So if you don't mind, I'm just going to run right back to Xiao. And I want to ask you the following question, if you can answer this, Xiao. Um, Canada can impose Magnitsky sanctions against specific Chinese officials who mistreated or silenced whistleblowers, including medical doctors and journalists, in the early days of the pandemic. How can these sanctions prove to be effective in holding the CCP to account? Well, thank you for the question. That's come back to the accountability. Uh, because the pandemic is beyond of the borders, causing damage to other nations and all over the world. So the accountability should also uh, count in that it, it, it can come from the other countries. The, uh, but let's, let me share this with you, that in China, the Chinese government has been quite successfully uh, uh, galvanizing the extreme nationalism to support its legitimacy, particularly when they're facing for, foreign governments, criticism, pressures, or sanctions. Uh, the, domestic and nationalistic sentiments will usually get very strong. But when you come to sanction to specific Chinese government officials with a specific crime or that uh, being accountable on human rights violations, such as Xinjiang, such as uh, or other human rights uh, violations. Now we're talking about uh, uh, the uh, uh, silencing the whistleblowers and others. Um, the Chinese public show unusual support to such sanction. The Chinese public opinion usually can be easily overwhelmed by the extreme nationalism when the issues like sanctioning specific Chinese government officials on specific <laughs> clear human rights violations, usually it's become silent, those nationalism voices. People can see those are bad things done by bad people. It is right to hold them accountable, whether within China or outside of China borders. Thank you very much, Xiao. Um, I'm gonna move now quickly to uh, Sarah and Chris before I open it up to some questions from the audience. Um, Sarah, we'll start with you and it'll be 
question for you, Chris. I'm very interested in hearing both of your interventions. Um, as you may know, uh, Canada co-sponsored the first ever global conference on media freedom forum on media freedom, sorry, and will be hosting the second conference in September 2020. What initiatives can Canada take with other democracies to safeguard the integrity of journalis journalism beyond China's borders? Um, so, uh, so, so there are a few things. Um, so in addition to all the various things I talked about happening inside China, uh, in January, Freedom House published a report that I'd written about um, Beijing's global megaphone and the way in which the Chinese government um, and the Communist parties, um, as, as Chris alluded to, um, really the, the propaganda, the disinformation, uh, the censorship efforts um, and control over content delivery systems and social media platforms uh, is increasingly expanding um, outside of China. And over the last decade, it's, it's, it's expanded. And over the last few years, it's, it's accelerated even further. Um, and so at the end of that report, we, we, have, um, you know, we have some recommendations. And I'll, I'll say three, uh, three that, that I think really stand out. Um, I think the first one, um, and this goes to this question of accountability, uh, is to really hold Chinese diplomats to account because um, they're increasingly aggressive. Uh, they engage in all kinds of uh, much worse intimidation, actually, than what uh, Chris had alluded to that Wang Yi had done during a public press conference uh, in terms of, especially within uh, Chinese um, communities outside of China, but not only, intimidating advertisers of, of, of distant Chinese media, uh, intimidating uh, journalists, um, uh, and, and now I think increasingly also spreading disinformation on social media platforms. So I, I think really calling them out uh, and even, you know, and we've had a few exa examples of this happening in the last few years um, uh, uh, is, is very important. Um, I, I think the other thing um, relates uh, to the social media platforms because a lot of the examples of censorship I was talking about were happening when we chat inside China. But increasingly, we're seeing um, evidence, certainly of surveillance. There was a big report um, identifying that of WeChat users outside of China, but also accounts of um, of censorship. Um, and WeChat is now being used by 100, 100, maybe even 200 million people outside of China, many, many members of the Chinese diaspora, but not only. In a lot of countries in Southeast Asia and in South Asia, uh, people are using it. And that just opens a huge door to all kinds of, of manipulations, electoral manipulation. and so. I think really making sure that these companies um, like Tencent that owns WeChat or like um, ByteDance that owns TikTok are, are really closely scrutinized in terms of the data privacy and, um, and also censorship and, and moderation uh, is, is very important. So that we're holding uh, them to the standards in, uh, in democratic societies as opposed to letting uh, the Chinese Communist Party bring its uh, repression and censorship uh, overseas. And I think the last thing is really trying to find ways to support uh, Chinese language media that are not aligned with Beijing um, and trying to find ways to support journalists, to support the media. Um, there, are, there are all kinds of, of different examples, um, but they really face an uphill battle. And I think um, you know, a lot of the media also in Hong Kong um, um, now with the national security uh, law uh, are, are gonna be facing an even tighter uh, environment. Um, and a lot of them are really an important source of information also for people inside China. Um, so I think, I think those would be three things that we're looking at the global expansion um, of, of China and Chinese Communist Party media controls. Uh, those are three things that uh, the countries like Canada, but not only, but other democracies can take. Thanks very much, Sarah. Um, Chris? So I think, first of all, it's important to recognize the initiative that the uh, Canadian government is taking to uh, organize this global media forum. It's it's so critically important uh, on so many levels. I think as it relates to uh, China's engagement in the media and information space globally, it's it's terribly important to put into context just how uh, massive the scale and scope of the engagement is. I think there's been an underestimation of this. Sarah alluded to uh, WeChat, WeChat now having one billion users overall, um, tens of millions of which are using the platform beyond China's borders. And the report issued last month by Citizen Lab at the University of Toronto, uh, among other things, identified the ways in which the monitoring of content on WeChat of users outside of China was being fed into um, uh, purposes for uh, refining censorship within China. And that's just one example of how this is working. And so I think there, there are some in extraordinarily important uh, systemic 
technological related issues for which we need a better understanding. There's also um, an effort that happens broadly speaking, and Sarah knows this so well, and she's done great work on it, on how the Chinese state engagement globally seeks on the one hand to amplify a very narrow set of views that are consistent with uh, that authoritarian government's point of view, uh, while at the same time working assiduously to sideline views wherever possible that are uh, challenging the government in Beijing. And this can be either in the form of uh, sidelining news outlets on the one hand or independent voices. And you can imagine in this day and age where journalists and news organizations are under such extraordinary duress uh, in financial terms, which will become undoubtedly more acute in the COVID uh, and post-COVID environment, uh, that the stress though, that, that all of these institutions will feel to um, um, get the word out and properly cover these issues will be all the more acute. And I think what um, any number of organizations have done recently, which is terribly important, including Freedom House, I'd note, is to start explaining in greater detail the ways in which um, local media institutions are using uh, news uh, content coming from Chinese state media sources. And this also has an economic basis. So for a news outlet in a country whose economy and news media is struggling, when they have an opportunity to uh, use and adopt uh, content coming, say, from Xinhua at either no cost or low cost compared to uh, news wires like Reuters, for example, uh, it's often the case that they will go with the less expensive uh, alternative. But I think it's important to recognize that in such cases, uh, less expensive does not mean less costly. And I think this is also something that um, we've underestimated in recent years. Thanks so much, Chris. Um, we have quite a few questions that, that have come in from the audience. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to read the first one out and I'm going to allocate it to, I think this one should be for Xiao. Um, so the first question reads as follows. Um, what non-Chinese pro-China disinformation efforts have you seen regarding COVID, either from individuals, organizations, or states? Well, all of them above. Right? Let's start from the states. Yeah, it's the... Uh, it's starting from the uh, spokesperson of foreign minister affairs of People's Republic of China, Zhao Zhijian, on his own tweet uh, account, like started to share the uh, unreliable information about the uh, coronavirus was brought to China by Amer American military personnel um, without presenting any evidence. That is from a state foreign minister, uh, uh, ministry's uh, spokesperson. If it's non-official or state media personnel like Global Times or uh, uh, Xinhua, but then there are individuals and in disguise, yeah, uh, technology trolls that on Twitter, actually today, uh, there's an article on uh, English media that uh, about Ch New York Times on the uh, Chinese, our Chinese government behind uh, thousands of Twitter accounts, that fake Twitter accounts, that when you, when the one uh, Twitter account tweeted something like China made a great victory uh, on the corona, uh, fighting for coronavirus, and then the thousands of Twitter accounts retweeting them as a microphone and uh, uh, to as a, uh, uh, that, that propaganda uh, uh, effort outside of China. But let's talk about another uh, issue which Sarah already touched upon, which is surveillance technology. The Chinese government is promoting now a new message, which is a centralized uh, top-down mobilization control uh, a system like China is now had advantage to uh, uh, combating the uh, coronavirus. Well, that does have some truth to it, but is this advantage what kind of cost of Chinese people are paying? The surveillance technology now being used from drones to cell phone apps, particularly this thing called health code, which on practically every Chinese citizen's cell phone right now, that collected your personal, not only health information, geolocation, social network information, and who knows what else, and can decide where you can go, 
uh, what kind of uh, transportation uh, uh, access you, you you could have or not having, and uh, uh, whether you can uh, go to a job or not. For controlling the pandemic, this is actually currently a very effective tool for case uh, uh, for the contact tracing, etc. But the Chinese government now, many local governments, starting with Suzhou, Hangzhou, uh, already started to announce that they are going to use this health code and health app for other government social services. In other words, they want this app stay on people's phone after the pandemic control. They use it beyond the pandemic control. And that is extremely worrisome because the Chinese uh, citizens' privacy and personal information is already in government hands. But if they are all on their app, in their cell phone on every day. Uh, that is a terrifying situation. Thank you very much, Xiao. Um, we're starting to run a bit out of time, but I think we have maybe a few more minutes for one or two more questions. So this question is for Sarah. Um, what can people in the West do to protect Chinese journalists, stand up for the rights of jail journalists? Um. Well, I think there's a few things. Um, one, just sharing their stories makes a difference. So making sure that people, when you come across the information, other people know about it. Certainly writing to your elected officials and asking them. I would say not only to write to officials in China, but to bring it up with the embassy, for example. Um, and actually, and I know I'm, I'm working at Freedom House, but I used to be very active in Amnesty International. Um, but I think you know, signing up for Amnesty's um, uh, alerts and, and writing letters. And I have interviewed people, they weren't journalists always, they were other political and religious prisoners from China. And you know, when the letters came in, they didn't always know that that was the case, um, but they noticed a change in the way they were being treated. And in fact, one fellow was saying that when they were doing forced labor in the labor camp, he asked for some kind of mask to protect him. And instead of the guards saying like, what are you talking about, get out of here. They actually gave masks to everybody in the room. And, um, you know, and only later he realized that it was because a bunch of people, I think it was especially from a small town in Sweden, were writing letters for him. Um, and, and so I think one of the things we see right now in China is that the Chinese government is uh, becoming more immune to international pressure. And so unfortunately, um, that kind of pressure doesn't result in people actually who are wrongfully jailed actually getting released. Um, but it can result in shorter prison terms and medical parole, or at least in, in protecting them from a torture uh, and abuse uh, in custody, which is so rampant in China. Uh, so I would say that's one thing. The other thing I would say um, is look at your investments um, because so many international retirement funds right now um, are invested in, in, in companies like Tencent, for example. And WeChat is just um, you know such a, a, a surveillance and increasingly a rest tool for the Chinese government uh, for, for professional journalists, but also as you saw for all kinds of ordinary citizens. So I'd say those are two things that, that people might want to consider. Thanks very much, Sarah. Um, and so we'll move to our last question because we are running out of time. And this one is for Chris. Um, Chris, what are some policy options against China? Should collective recognition of Taiwan's independence or the inclusion of Japan, South Korea, and even India into NATO be considered? So I think the way to that I would address that question, not um, engaging in a policy debate, which um, which Ned does not do. But I think I would, I would take uh, the spirit of that question and answer it in the following way, which is to say uh, the paramount um, uh, value we should look for now is unity. I think what we're seeing in so many settings, starting with some of the strongest performing, most mature democracies on the globe, countries like Sweden, Denmark, um, countries in other parts of Europe, are facing enormous challenges that their societies are grappling with. Australia was among the first countries to uh, really start to engage and have a meaningful public discussion about ways to respond to the corrosive aspects of the Chinese party state's engagement in that country and responding in a way that stayed true to liberal democratic values. I think the debates that happen in places like Australia and elsewhere uh, show that this is really uh, difficult business and you can't skirt it. Uh, what you need are both journalists and civil society putting these issues into the public domain so that ordinary citizens and policymakers 
have a clear understanding and put them into context, and then have uh, society settle on the sorts of responses that can ensure the integrity of democratic institutions, including free expression, which has really been at the epicenter of this debate when you boil everything away. It's, uh, it's been central to what's happening in universities. It's been central to what's been happening in the media sector. In so many instances, it's been central to uh, public policy and political discussions in the countries I mentioned and others. There's really no country that's escaping this. I think the other thing we have to bear in mind is that to the extent the more mature democracies are unable to settle on the norms and standards for the sort of full spectrum response that's required to uh, properly defend democracy, it's gonna be incredibly difficult for um, uh, countries whose institutional roots are not as strong. And right now, I think what we need to recognize is that we're really all in this together and we need to try to find ways both within our own countries to support um, each other and our institutions. And then uh, beyond that, to make sure that democratic states are supporting each other. Um, and that's true uh, within uh, North America and farther afield. And so I think we should really emphasize this aspect of it, uh, even under these difficult circumstances. Wonderful. So folks, we're out of time. Um, I just want to say very quickly that I'd like to thank um, our distinguished group of panelists for their very insightful remarks and their expertise. This has been extremely interesting. And I will now move you to uh, panel two, uh, which will be moderated by um, Kyle Matthews on China's political prisoners and mistreatment of my minorities. Thank you very much, everybody. <laughs>